Okay, um, once again, good morning to everyone and welcome to this seminar, uh, Curbing Corruptions by Improving Economic Governance uh, in the Middle East and uh, Central Asia. Corruption corrodes the uh, trust in government and institutions. Um, and of course, it holds back economic growth and weakens uh, countries. When it is widespread, corruptions can be difficult even for honest people to resist. So what can we do about it? One way to fight it is to improve uh, economic institutions, uh, or what we call economic uh, governance. This means to improve um, the systems of institutions, policies, and rules uh, which shape economic incentives. Weak economic governance uh, exposes societies to corruptions. On the other hand, strong uh, governance supported by effective implementations can curb it. The IMF has stepped up uh, its work on governance. We are now working uh, systematic and even-handed uh, assessment of, governments, of governance and uh, corruption problems uh, with all, all of our member countries. We are also having candid discussions uh, with countries on these problems. Another example uh, of our work on curbing corruptions can be seen in the recently published uh, physical monitors. Uh, if you are um, interested in it, you can look for it. Um, today's seminar focus on countries in the Middle East and Central Asia. In these regions, there are some success stories in the regions um, which, which other countries can learn from. For example, in the last decade, Georgia put in place governance and anti-corruption reforms and have achieved a major improvement, including raising tax revenues dramatically. There are also many countries in the regions with serious economic uh, governance problems. Often, corruptions and unequal opportunities, especially affect women's and young people and are a source of frustrations uh, for many. So our work of this region so far suggests that lack of physical transparencies and complex but poorly administered regulations are some of the most important governance issues in the regions. On the other hand, more open and transparent government budget and the better governance structures for state-owned enterprises, including extractive industries, would reduce opportunities for rent-seeking and theft. Also, simpler and better enforced business laws and regulations would reduce costs to private sectors firms and would create more equal opportunities for all citizens. So we will uh, present some of this work to member, uh, member government. And of course, as we did uh, just recently uh, in the Dubai, uh, at the Dubai World uh, Government uh, Summit uh, just this past February in 2019. And of course, we'll be publishing a staff paper on these issues later this year uh, to update this, uh, the, the experiences. We also hope uh, to learn from policymakers and experts uh, with us, particularly today, and who have led effort to improve governance and fight corruptions. I believe there's a lot uh, to learn from our panels on what we can be done more to improve uh, governance and curb um, corruptions. 
So with these remarks, uh, now let me uh, uh, welcome uh, back to the front uh, Minoshi Shafik, uh, our dear friend and former colleagues. And Minoshi now is the uh, director of the uh, London uh, School of Economics, and she will lead the uh, important discussions. So Minoshi, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as was just said, uh, in a previous very happy chapter of my life, I was a deputy managing director here at the IMF, and it is really lovely for me to see so many former colleagues and friends in this room. Uh, now, we have a very important topic to discuss uh, this morning, and we have three very excellent panelists who have been both analyzed the problem, but also have been practitioners in addressing corruption issues in three very different countries. Let me introduce them briefly, and then we'll start the conversation. Uh, to my left is Alexei Alexishvili, who is the chairman and CEO of Policy and Management Consulting. But prior to that, he was finance minister in Georgia, where he successfully led a series of reforms of public finance, tax, and customs policy and administration, and business climate reforms, which were critical for reducing corruption in Georgia. Following that, we'll hear from Sousan Rayeba, who is the co-founder and chairperson of Rashid, which is part of Transparency International, and it is the leading civil society organization in Jordan working on integrity and transparency issues. And then after that, we'll hear from Zain Zedan, who's the deputy uh, head of the Africa department here at the IMF. He's also been the co-author of the recent IMF board paper on governance issues, which looks at how to, the IMF can support tackling corruption. And in his prior life, he was a senior, uh, a senior leader in Mauritania and served as prime minister, governor of the central bank, and economic advisor to the president of Mauritania. So let's start with, with you, Alexei, and I'm going to start you to talk a little, start to get you to talk a little bit about the sweeping reforms that you instituted in Georgia. Tell us a little bit more about what you chose to focus on and in what order, uh, and what you think are the first priority issues that countries should address when thinking about tackling corruption. Thank you very much. Um, uh, first of all, I'd uh, like to start with the, uh, the uh, why Georgia is considered to be a successful country in fighting corruption. Uh, so uh, by World Bank uh, researches and many other international organizations uh, researches, uh, Georgia was considered as one of the most corrupted country in 2002-2003. Um, uh, and um, that, I mean, looking at the region of Eastern Europe and Central Asia, that uh, was, um, we directly can say that that was like failed country in that, in that perspective. So we even thought that, um, uh, looking at Georgia at that time, we thought uh, this is type of uh, cultural stuff, like, you know, something that comes from our uh, history that is not possible to combat, etc., etc. But um, uh, then later on, when we um, started looking at that, and when new uh, political generation came into power, looking at the situation and started working on that, there was like quite complex approach, and that was not only one specifically working on fiscal part or specifically working on fighting corruption in terms of um, uh, criminal cases and, and dealing with that from from a criminal perspective, but that was more complex dealing with um, doing business reform, dealing with uh, administrative reform, public administrative reform, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. If I may uh, uh, kind of select two or three major topics, I would say that the most important part was the fiscal one, because if treasury is empty, then of course you cannot do anything in this regard, because you need to care about uh, public servants, their salaries, and that's a very important part. At the same time, you need to show that uh, reform has significant results. I mean, that has to have uh, particular results in terms of social aspect, and then, of course, there is the need for society support for this anti-corruption process. And uh, 
At the same time, um, the second and the third one is that, uh, the, the second one is uh, deregulation because especially countries from Soviet heritage, then they are heavily regulated. And then there is the need for deregulate the whole economy because this is, not, and at the same time, this is not easy. We heard uh, before a lot of instruments like guillotine, which never worked in Georgia because whatever you, uh, 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 regulations you eliminate, there were a lot, many others that coming from different sources, like you know, local governments or central government agencies or quasi-government institutions, etc. So the idea was to deal with that and then later on we called that so-called zero plus model when we said that, okay, let's just assume that there are no licenses at all, permits, registrations, papers, etc., etc. And now let's start from the zero. And where we need these licenses and permits, etc. And then that worked quite well because uh, there was a significant signal, signal to public institutions that they have to care about that as much as possible. So, and the third one was uh, overall small government philosophy. When we, when you can deal with regulations, you can eliminate regulations, but if you don't de-bureaucratize the whole system or reduce somehow uh, the bureaucracy working previously on those regulations, definitely they will invent something else. So they will invent new ones. And then you cannot just deal with that because the, the, the function of bureaucracy is to, to regulate something. And then there, there was uh, important um, approach towards that because we, we, we had clear um, kind of vision and mindset that we need to, to reduce that as, um, on, on, a, on a proper level as much as possible. So in terms of fiscal, which is very important and I will uh, uh, allow other speakers to, to, um, to speak, um, uh, in, in terms of fiscal then we started from the tax code and tax system was the most important one. So in terms of tax system, uh, we started working on that uh, in 2004 and the main idea was to, to create some kind of tax system which uh, is as simple as possible to understand, then as easy as possible to, to implement mm -hmm. uh, for both sides, for taxpayers as well as for tax administration. Uh, as universal as possible because this is very important and then of course um, uh, with uh, as uh, with uh, with low burden as possible. So, so of course uh, this is like very simple. I mean, if you look at any textbook of tax uh, tax policy, then you find that what is the best uh, and perfect tax system. This is exactly tax system. But but the, in reality, that's not easy to achieve, right? So what we did is that we had 22 different type of taxes, and we reduced this number of taxes to from 22 to seven first, and then to six because we eliminated all inefficient taxes as much as possible. At the same time, we eliminated all these uh, exemptions, which were the, not so much efficient. At the same time, we reduced tax rates as much as possible, uh, so that you know, the, for 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 taxpayers, we wanted to create some some trusted environments because the the, the, the usually the trust is correctly mentioned here. Trust between state and the the citizens and taxpayers is the most yeah. crucial one uh, in this in this case. Okay, thank you, Alexi. I'm going to turn to, to Zane next. Uh, you were a government official, very senior levels in Mauritania, and you had firsthand experience of dealing with corruption. And I think what Alexi has illustrated is that corruption thrives in complexity, complex fiscal, complex regulatory systems. How does that resonate for countries in particular in the Middle East and North Africa? And what, uh, what uh, do you think the importance is of addressing corruption per se is relative to all the other things that governments have to worry about. So let me start by the last, the second question, the second part of your question. So uh, it's, if you look a little bit to uh, many countries and particular to my country, um, as a policymaker, what I, I heard from many citizens, uh, entrepreneurs is it's very difficult to, to get anything done in these countries without connections. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's hard to do business, it's hard to get public services, it's, it's hard to, um, uh, to, to do anything without connection. And this is obviously very detrimental to growth, very detrimental to inequality. As said by Mr. Jung, it's something that 
will affect the most vulnerable in the, in the countries, so uh, the youth, women. So it's, I, I, I can't understand that we can address the economic and social challenges without addressing governance and corruption. Uh, and this is what I felt when, 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 when I was in government, that this is something that, really that has to be addressed. Yeah. Uh, I just, uh, spoke about uh, complexity. I would, I would like also to say that it's the complexity, part of this complexity also create lack of transparency. And, and the, the first thing I, I wanted to start with is really create an environment with a lot of transparency. So I can tell you that when I started uh, nominating the cabinet, every minister has to know at the beginning that, they will that we will have an asset declaration system. They start by making sure that everyone has a starting point, yeah. initial condition where they are, and, and, and we, we, after that, we, set, we, we, did, we put in place a legal framework and the commission to really check that people can, will put their asset declaration, can be verified, and, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, we pushed on transparency on everything, on, obviously on EITI because it was a beginning an oil exporting countries, uh, mining exporting countries, so pushed on, on EITI, we pushed on transparency in terms of budget, implementation, budget approval and budget implementation. We pushed on, transparency is really the, 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 the people will, it's very important for people really to get access to all the information uh, that is available out there. Those they can really exert, exert their role in terms of uh, asking for accountability, accountability and making sure that. Uh, the second thing is really to do some of the small reforms like the case here. I think the public financial management is a big, big issue in many of these countries like procurement. Mm -hmm. I think the civil service, the big problem is that services are, the, the government is, is, is implemented by people, by civil servant. And so unless you have a good, a strong framework for civil servant, and I know it's not only about wage, but also it's about having a, a merit-based civil service, which is often not the case. So often the civil service is based on nepotism, client, clientelism, or the, or the aspects. So when you, once you have that, it's very difficult really to get people yeah. who, who become accountable to people, to their citizens, rather than to their network. So it's important to have a civil service that is merit-based. The simple thing we, we put is that we, we, we try to minimize the politicization of the civil service. So for example, and nobody under the director level can be actually appointed by the, 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 the cabinet. So it has to be only merit-based, performance-based to be, to be promoted to any position. So small steps to make sure that, that you, you, can, you can deal with this. Uh, rents, the problem is many of these countries are also rent are everywhere. So if you want to get access to land, if you want to get access to foreign exchange, if you want to get to access to anything, you have to, there are a lot of friends, so premium on parallel markets, so you have, so it's making really, getting rid of these opportunity, opportunities for rents is also something that is critical. So no more distribution by the state of land. So if we're gonna go do land, we, we sell the land on the market and we get the, the market price rather than doing, giving and it to someone auction. who will sell it to someone else yeah. with uh, no, more, no more intervention for the central bank to provide people with foreign currency that can be then uh, 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 so, sold on the, on, the, uh, on the parallel exchange market. So really getting rid of, of some of these rent is really critical to make sure that, that uh, obviously the business environment is a big, big issue. So um, complex regulation, really simplifying regulation, eliminating gate, gatekeepers, because in many of these places, so you, if you want to do business, you have to go through many gates. And so all of these gatekeepers are, are basically opportunities for bribery. So moving more to e-governments, so making these services available online, minimizing the interaction between between citizen and businesses and, 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 and civil servants. All these are small steps that a bit like what have, have been done and we try to do to actually minimize the level of corruption and, 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 and improve governance in the country. Okay, thank you. So from a civil society perspective, do you agree with the kinds of priorities that have just been identified or would you, have, would you say something different? 
Uh, there are some similarities, actually. We, we do meet at a number of points. But I would like to look at the Arab uh, region in uh, terms of um, uh, numbers related to uh, corruption uh, perception using uh, TI's Corruption Perception Index. In 2013, the average score uh, was 37 uh, and a half out of uh, 100, which is way below the global average. Mm. 2018, the average score is 39. So we don't see much improvement in five years, considering that uh, a lot has been invested in some reform of institutions, strengthening uh, uh, anti-corruption commissions, for example, and um, introducing some laws. But at the same time, we had the backing of the people who demonstrated in the streets uh, five years ago to demand, uh, um, in, uh, demand equality and um, combating corruption. So as civil society organizations, we had to stop and rethink uh, whether we've been addressing uh, the right priorities or using the right tools to, uh, to tackle uh, corruption. And we engaged uh, as civil society organizations in a process of rethinking corruption and rethinking uh, anti-corruption interventions. So what we came up with is that, uh, anti uh, is that corruption is an ecosystem. It has a lot of complex relationships, um, exactly like my colleagues have mentioned. And our role uh, is to actually look at a holistic approach to address uh, this issue. Um, and to do so, we need to be thinking about sustainability. And I would like to uh, support this with an example from Jordan when um, in 2000, uh, at the early uh, times of the Arab Spring, we amended our anti-corruption law to strengthen the Anti-Corruption Commission. But two years later, there was another amendment to reduce the independence of the Anti-Corruption Commission and to add uh, statutory limitations to the acts of corruption. Now we're in the process of revisiting the law again to uh, bring back uh, the changes to strengthen independence and also um, uh, remove statutory li limitations uh, in, in addition to other uh, requirements. So uh, ensuring sustainability of changes is also very important. As uh, um, CSOs working in the Arab region, we did meet a number of times to try to see what our priorities are. Mm -hmm. And the similarities to what my colleagues just mentioned uh, are, um, are there. Fiscal transparency came very high on the, uh, on the agenda. We need transparency in the collection of uh, funds, mm -hmm. co uh, transparency in how it is managed and, and spent. And within that, we look into procurement as well. Um, we have developed a regional program as Transparency International Chapters in the Arab region to tackle this issue. It started at the beginning of this year and, uh, and we're implementing it simultaneously in a number of Arab countries uh, as civil society. But two lessons came out that are very important. The first is that this has to uh, come, uh, fiscal transparency or budget transparency has to be at the national and also local budgets as well. Mm. Uh, we can't tackle one um, and leave the other. And the other important issue is that we have to go a little bit deeper. It is not really enough to see that a hospital contract was uh, done in a proper way, but we need to ask the question, is the hospital needed in the first place in that particular area? And there's a lot of room for civil society to be engaging in that uh, type of discussion. Moving on, we uh, also as uh, CSOs in the Arab region believe that um, uh, we have been tackling public uh, um, officials or public institutions in reform initiatives, but uh, ignoring uh, extractive industries, which is a very important area. Um, State-owned enterprises is also an area that we need to address because uh, it's, uh, it's very untransparent and we don't know what's going on there. And the private sector, and there is movement within the private sector to try to strengthen their internal um, governance policies, and we need to capitalize on that as well. Now, these together also link up with political integrity and uh, illicit financial flows uh, across the uh, Arab region as uh, a priority. So that's the second cluster. The third, and, and, uh, and this is coming up recently, we're evaluating national anti-corruption strategies. Uh, each of our countries have developed a framework. Mm -hmm. We noticed that in order to make sure that it is implemented, it needs to be funded, not only by donors, but also by the, uh, by the government itself. And this commitment is highly needed, and it has to be reflected uh, moving forward.
And finally, the fourth element which is appearing um, as well is the need to look at uh, climate change and natural resources and integrity in water, which is a very, it's a high important uh, uh, area in, in the Arab region. We we're discussing it and we're in the uh, discussion phases with uh, TI to look into how to create synergies between uh, Arab civil societies in uh, uh, the nexus between corruption and natural uh, resources. Thank you. Can I just ask all the panelists, sometimes people talk about a distinction between sort of petty corruption, small level bribes for regulatory facilitation and that kind of thing, and grand corruption, sort of high level political people with you know, millions uh, going astray. Do you think that's a meaningful concept or is it, you know, is the problem much more systemic? And I think particularly from the numbers you cited, South Sudan, of perception being, perception of corruption being very high in this part of the world. Is it because of the grand corruption that perception is so, is so problematic? Or is that really not a, what, the right way to think about it? I'd be interested in any of your views on that. So, uh, from, yeah, from my perspective, I think both of them are quite problematic. So if there is the need to uh, approach and uh, fight against uh, corruption, we need to consider the, the both uh, part because this petty corruption is uh, quite problematic for the whole society, for small businesses, for individuals, for everybody. So this is, uh, this is a really very um, uh, sensitive issue in terms of uh, um, in terms of overall society's happiness and, and perception, where they live and what type of society they are, they belong to. So uh, that's the, 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 therefore I think that this uh, so-called uh, low-hanging fruits, which are in this process, has to be considered. I mean, if there is the need to solve this issue, better to solve this rather than just think about some more sophisticated. Uh, systemic type of approaches and then and, and fighting against like you know trying to have these so-called mid or long-term uh, goals in in this process in fighting uh, against corruption so I think that the overall process has to be well mixed to each other I mean there has to be some kind of easy steps or so-called short-term um, uh, short-term actions and uh, with the proper uh, consequences at the end and then has to be also some kind of tough decisions with more mid-term and long-term uh, uh, actions and that has to be like well structured into each other. I, I think bo both are, are obviously problematic. Um, one, so the petty corruption makes it hard for everyone to really get access to anything, services, to business, but I would think also that the, the successful experiences have shown that it's really you need to have to lead from the top and, and in a context where you have grand corruption it's very difficult to, to, to do that. So, so I think it's, uh, it's important really to, uh, and the example of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, Georgia and, and also another example in Africa that was both cited in the fiscal monitor in the case of Rwanda, an example where you really see the drive from the top, which makes it very hard for, for grand corruption to happen. And if grand corruption happens, it's very difficult for people who are below to just accept that uh, exactly. people are, who are on the top can do this, but not them. So, yeah, so it's, it's, it's very difficult. Absolutely. Maybe I'm going to come back to you, Alex. If you could yes. say something about uh, vested interests. How, in, in any battle against corruption, the hardest part is tackling the vested interests. Yes. How did you do that in Georgia and what lessons do you draw from that? I think this is the most uh, problematic part mm. of this process. Uh, and uh, from my point of view, again, um, the, the important uh, uh, contributor to this is um, uh, uh, if we look at that, what are the major, major problematic part? I mean, that was already mentioned several times. The, the most uh, the biggest uh, source of corruption in terms of vested interest, this is like either big state-owned enterprises or this is the, these are areas or sectors where government's intervention is really very high because uh, 
uh, it cannot happen when there is vast interest and then the government is absolutely isolated from that or it's like you know uh, ignored somehow because this is somehow linked to each other and the most important part is how we can kind of dismantle it how we can just create the environment when we don't have either these big state owned enterprises and uh, this is fully privatized or there are some kind of environment which helps more transparent way to to tackle this uh, big uh, vast interest in this case. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, and of course, there is also some kind of linkage with uh, political corruption, which is also a problematic one. And uh, political corruption that was correctly mentioned, uh, uh, we need to have some uh, the further transparency of uh, public uh, servants and public uh, high high public uh, uh, figures as well as uh, all others as much as possible. So that can be the instrument to to tackle this part of uh, corruption. Maybe Selsan, could you talk a little bit about the politics of getting support for anti-corruption measures and how civil society can help? kind of embarrass vested interests or, or make it very uncomfortable for them. Uh, yeah, yes, of course. I mean, I would uh, start by saying that civil society is now really more than a watchdog and we have many roles to play. And the first uh, role that helps uh, in, in this issue is uh, expertise. Civil society has a number of experts in different topics and themes and, and uh, we uh, we do the research on a day-to-day -day basis on what's happening in our countries, but we also uh, monitor third-party assessments as well about our country, and we can enrich uh, th those um, uh, those assessments as well. Uh, in the Arab region, there are uh, civil society organizations with uh, great expertise in various areas, such as uh, uh, election financing, uh, campaign financing, access to information, and uh, public-private partnerships, which. Uh, uh, which is very important and a heated topic here in, uh, in our region. <coughs> Second rule we do is hold our governments accountable and we are becoming very creative in developing tools to hold uh, governments accountable uh, to their commitments and uh, to uh, how they execute uh, uh, these commitments on the ground. And uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit when I talk about um, uh, Rashid uh, Transparency Jordan uh, and the tools they're, uh, they're adopting. Uh, the third is um, explaining. A lot of the discussions use very technical terms and uh, our role as civil society is re to really try to simplify what is meant by that. Uh, one e recent example uh, from Jordan is uh, when uh, the anti-money laundry uh, unit decided to include civil society under the list of entities that follow anti-money laundry rules. Uh, it was a small mention in the newspaper and that was it, of course not consulted with civil society, but our role as uh, CSOs is to come together and bring the anti-money laundry unit uh, executives to explain in, in a public hearing what this means and, uh, and the details of what is involved uh, in this issue. The same applies to uh, economics uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, the documents of uh, institutions such as uh, the World Bank. The fourth role, which I believe is becoming even more important, is to be ready. Um, you mentioned asset declaration, and uh, in my country we're working on an asset declaration or discussing an asset declaration. We have to be ready and not just react. We have to do the research, uh, come up with the options and the models, and then present it when the time uh, comes. And, uh, and this prepare, uh, preparing uh, phase is taking more of uh, our time and resources. Uh, nowadays, but coming uh, very handy. Okay. Sure. Say a little bit about the role of the fund and how the fund can support countries to tackle these issues and how enhancing with a focus on governance can actually help countries in the Middle East and North Africa. Okay. So I want to first to recognize two of my colleagues who really co-authored the paper, Seda Ogada, who is our deputy director for uh, the legal department and Paolo Mauro, who is also Deputy Director in the Fiscal Affairs Department, who are uh, uh, colleagues on, the, on, this, on this paper. So, um, I, as I said before, and, and uh, clearly the work we've, we've been stepping up, our work on, on governance and corruption, mm -hmm. 
We did a staff discussion not a few years ago on the cost of corruption and the implication of corruption. We did this paper. We, you've seen the fiscal monitor, uh, the chapter of the fiscal monitor that just uh, came out uh, a few days ago. So all of these clearly show that the cost of corruption is high. Yeah. It's very high in terms of growth, in terms of fiscal uh, performance, uh, on revenue mobilization, on efficiency of spending, on, on, on fiscal, uh, on financial stability and, and uh, the region uh, you are in, the Central Asia region is particularly a region where there are a lot of financial sector issues related to governance that actually led to a lot of uh, costly bailouts. So, so clearly governance and corruption is a big problem for uh, domestic and external stability in many, in many places. Mm -hmm. And this is why the fund sees that we have, a, we have a bigger role to get involved in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, governance and corruption. So we, in, in, in the new policy, new framework, I would say we have two main innovations that can be very helpful for the region. The first is that we're getting more systematic about corruption. So rather than just looking to, uh, to, to the issue of some aspect of governance of corruption, we've been always been involved in public financial management, been involved in financial safeguard, in MLCFT. We're looking really to, we developed a, 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 an integrated framework where we look to corruption and the indicators of corruption, but we look also to some of the key state functions. The first one is obviously fiscal, fiscal governance, how to, in terms of revenue mobilization, spending, uh, institution and outcomes, but also in terms of fiscal transparency, looking to the framework to, to oversee the financial sector, looking to how central banks are, 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 are managed, uh, looking to the regulatory framework, which is with the, the question on business environment, environment, the MLCFT, looking to all these things. And why we need to look to all these things? Because by doing this, we can better tailor our policy advice. What are the priorities? Where, to, where, where we, can, we can start? Where should we focus all our capacity development effort? So, so the framework is going to really help countries have a, have an, a holistic view of the problem. And from that, really, identify what are the priorities and us coming to help them and getting ready to help them in terms of capacity development. So the first innovation for us is really this, this holistic approach that we, we, we try to. The second one is also we're looking to, the, to this problem as a global problem, not, not only country specific problem. And this is why in our new framework, we are looking in particular to this, what we call the supply side of corruption. So basically, you have corruption in many of these developing countries because you have firms who are abroad, or it's the firms who are investing in these countries or trading with these countries or providing financing. If you look to the case of Mozambique, for example, which is not in the region, but so all these, so you have firms in other countries that are bribing officials to get contract or to get things done in these, in these countries. And unless there is a strong framework in the home countries to really prevent that, uh, when it happened, penalize it, it's very difficult really to get things done. So we need to have the whole international community actually involved in, the, in, the, in this thing. The second aspect of that, of that supply side is that also, where is the money? What are the proceeds of corruption? Right. So are they in, in these developing countries or are they some, somewhere else? Yeah. And, so, and so basically, unless we make it very hard to hide the proceeds of corruption, corruption will continue to flourish. So, so this is also another way we, and this is why we, in, we included in our new policy framework, something that is focused on these two, two framework, two dimensions. Mm -hmm. and, and we think this is, will be very helpful for all developing countries and in particular for the MENA, MENA region countries. Um, we, so for this part, it's for the moment, it's not something completely mandatory unless in, in, on, on few specific cases. But we have already the G7 countries plus two other countries who are already volunteered to have these issues uh, looked at in, in, under, the, on, under our bilateral surveillance. And we have already several staff report. And we're putting pressure on these countries. And if we get traction, this certainly is going to have 
a significant impact in terms of really reducing opportunities for corruption in, in, in the MENA region. A follow-up question on that. I think there's been a, there has been a lot of effort on legal mechanisms to recover stolen assets. And I think my perception of that is that it's been very difficult. Uh, the costs, the legal time, the success in terms of recovery has been very poor. Um, however, the know, thy, know your customer pressures on banking institutions and, and that transparency has, has, I think, probably been a bit more successful at recovering and making it difficult for people who have corrupt incomes to hold on to them. So they're, they're increasingly having nowhere to hide in the international financial system. Would you agree with that? Do you think that that's the route to I get think, at I the problem? I think this is a program, I f you're right, this has to be prevented rather than really uh, try to recover these assets. And prevention yeah. is really, as you say, uh, know your customer, have transparency in terms of beneficial ownership, right. So, which is a big problem. So people can create fictive firms with uh, beneficial exactly. owners who are not known. So we need really to be, yeah. and there are still jurisdiction, including in some of the advanced economy where we have problems in, on yeah. these issues. So these have, have to be addressed and tackled very seriously. Good. Uh, I think we've got some time for some questions. So if it's okay, I'll take a few questions and then come back to the panel. Uh, there are two sets of mics, one here, one here. And so let me open it up if anyone would like to ask a question or make an observation. Gentleman here. I think we've got time for a few more. Uh, gentleman there. And I need a woman. I need a woman. One right here. There we are. This one here. Good morning, and thank you for introduction and informative uh, speeches. And if you could introduce yourself, that would be great. My name is Dr. Sherm. I am an uh, economics professor at the West Cliff University, California. Okay. Uh, my question, this uh, today's meeting related directly to the Central Asian. So far, I didn't hear anything about Central Asian corruptions. And uh, for example, Uzbekistan was until recently most corrupt country worse than Georgian corruption. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Uzbekistan former president, which was for 27 years, he passed away two years ago. And after that, a uh, new president take over and now is changing. Do you think that changes of the government reducing the, of the index of the corruption in Uzbekistan? Do you have that information or not? Next, my question to the Mr. Alexis Shvili. You mentioned that you reduce tax system simply and easy to use for everyone as well as tax inspectorate and the people who pay the taxes and for 20, from 22 taxes to reduce to six taxes. That means you kept all the tax revenue, you changed the combined many of them in one, three on in one, five in one. How did you do that? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. This gentleman here. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Mohamdi and I'm from Tunisia. So my question is about uh, the supply side corruption that was mentioned earlier. So uh, do you think that the, um, the, FC, uh, the FCPA Foreign Corrupt Practice Act in the United States is efficient or is uh, treating all companies equally when it comes to fighting corruption overseas, uh, especially this uh, supply side uh, it's the man, how, how do you call it? So supply side uh, uh, corruption. And my other mm -hmm. question is on the definition of corruption, as it's usually mentioned in the working papers of the IMF, which is limited to acts where there is a public official who is involved. So, do you think that this definition should be expanded and include corruption within the private sector between actors in the private sector without the involvement of public officials? Thank you. Okay, thank you. And the lady here. Okay, I think we've got time for one more. Go ahead. My name is Alia Mubayed. I'm, I'm an economist covering the region at Jeffries. Uh, I used to be a YP working on Georgia, uh, and, and it was uh, um, at that time uh, um, basically the star in terms of basically fighting what you called grand corruption, but um, I think the term uh, then at the World Bank was about state capture. And it is exactly uh, that the, the, the definition was about uh, how do we um, uh, prevent basically making sure that those who are governing shape the rules in a way uh, to um, consolidate their grip on power 
and their basically uh, um, uh, entrenched vested interest in the system and make it much harder to, uh, to cover corruption. So the question is, um, I mean, uh, experience of countries in fighting state capture has been this small so far. I mean, the latest is South Africa now with the ongoing basically National Commission on State Capture that is happening in South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one way uh, in, in, uh, in the Balkans uh, that EBRD helped was about trying, uh, and, and of course the bank, is about a uh, costing corruption, making benchmarking, uh, uh, basically trying to, to gather information on the impact and the cost of corruption across countries and make it much more transparent about uh, uh, investors globally to compare uh, uh, the incidence of corruption in each country and that make their decision um, about uh, investing in those countries accordingly. So uh, we didn't see that happening in the uh, Middle East and Central Asia region. So can the IMF for for example, again, learned from other uh, regions where we had successfully engaged in such a benchmarking which supported uh, civil society work to do this more proactively in the region. Uh, uh, so that's the question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I think last one for the woman here. Yes. And if, again, if you could introduce yourself. Yes, Jill Shooker. Um, I'm on the board of something called the uh, International Integrities International. And I'm also a former head of the OECD office uh, here in the United States and Canada. My question is understanding the difficulty of putting a entity such as an international anti-corruption court together. Mm -hmm. I'm curious as to what your reaction would be to having something of that sort, particularly to tackle uh, grand corruption. Thank you. Okay, good question. I think I'll start with you, Alexia. I think there were several questions in yes. your direction. <clears throat> so um, uh, I'll start with the fiscal reform in Georgia and uh, the question that was raised here uh, uh, regarding uh, revenue mobilization. So to, uh, to give you just general uh, figures uh, is that um, 95 or, or around 95 percent of uh, the budget revenues comes from tax revenue. So, so tax revenue is really very important part of, uh, of uh, fiscal revenue in Georgia. So in 2003, 2003 tax to GDP ratio was uh, around 12 percent. So after those reforms that I mentioned in, uh, in fiscal side, not only in fiscal side, but also in public administration, law enforcement institutions, etc., etc., because that was not, again, like only one side reform, but that was quite complex, I mean, covering many different areas of uh, public governance. And this particular figure increased from 12% to 25% in, two, in three consecutive years, from 2004 to 2007. So at the same time, this revenue collection has been increased. But at the same time, FDI increased from around 200 million to 2 billion. Mm -hmm. That was also quite impressive, as well as GDP growth rate was really very high those period of time. At the same time, uh, doing business indicator has been improved in Georgia from 134 to 19 in 2009, mm -hmm. and right now we are standing at six. So, uh, so that kind of, uh, th these figures, and that shows that uh, this fiscal reform had uh, definitely some sense, and that was in, uh, contributing to, to this, uh, this, this part. As uh, uh, here mentioned, that 22 was just directly uh, re reduced to six. Of course, there was like, you know, not only just, you know, eliminating t some taxes, but there was a huge tax reform. For example, in, mm -hmm. in excise tax, that was a significant reform. In VAT, in many different local taxes, etc., etc. So that was not just just only elimination. There was a, 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 a systemic, systemic changes there. Regarding Uzbekistan, what I can say is that Looking at the current development, I, I'm very much optimistic. I think that the, the process goes forward. Uh, of course, it's not easy. I mean, that's not easy, and I, we should not expect, from my point of view, we should not expect some results just uh, uh, right away. I mean, uh, yeah. t tomorrow or day after tomorrow. That will take some time after, I don't know, 25 years being in I isolated, being having just an absolutely different environment, now just, you know, dramatically changing the whole stuff is not easy. So that should take some time. And um, regarding, uh, regarding cor corruption and then 
level of sustainability in corruption in Georgia. As I mentioned, in 2003, that was one of the most corrupted countries in the region. And s since 2007, this is the least corrupted country in the region. So, and we still keep this level, uh, regardless the political changes in the in the government. So, uh, regardless the, the transformation that happened in 2012, the overall systemic approach helped us to keep this level as good as possible. So, I think that that also shows that systemic approach and then like uh, fighting corruption in, in the roots, that is very helpful. And the final one is that reform replication to un other countries. Uh, I don't believe that this is possible. I mean, I, I, we cannot say that, okay, here is the lesson of Georgia, now let's do it somewhere else. I mean, this is not the way how that works. The only way to work is, is that we just study those lessons and uh, just simply, for example, issue of related to sequence of reforms and actions, issue of communication with the society, which is really very important, and issue of taking leadership and taking the ownership of these reforms. Otherwise, it doesn't work. This is the major stuff that we need to consider. Okay, very good. Sausan, over to you. And you might want to say something about the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and also this, does the public sector have to be involved? Is there private sector corruption that one needs to also worry about? But oh, uh, of course, there is <laughs> private sector corruption that uh, uh, has to be involved. And uh, and uh, the definition of, uh, of corruption, um, the one referred to, um, might uh, might signal that it uh, it uh, tackles only public officials, but in fact it it does not. It is it ex extends beyond, and this is the um, what the uh, international framework uh, under the UN Convention Against Corruption uh, is advocating for that uh, we don't limit uh, corrupt acts to uh, public officials uh, at all. Thank okay. you. Very good. Same. Uh, so few things. So. I don't have the full information on Uzbekistan, but what we've seen in many places is really the new leaders. Having a government change is always an, a good opportunity to, to, to change the course of action. So, mm. so um, uh, frankly, I, uh, I would see it more as an opportunity rather than focusing on the numbers right now. On, on the US, I can give you an example of what's happening right, right now with Mozambique is a case where we, you've certainly heard about uh, hidden debt. And, and so, mm. uh, so now the U.S. is, is, is um, prosecuting the former finance minister, the head of some of these banks who have been involved. And it's creating actually a, dynam a new dynamic in the country itself with a lot of people who have been... Uh, so so it's, it's really a, a positive st step. I don't think that we... In the current context, we should think about international institutions. There are, there are a lot of other international institutions that are in place and are struggling really to, to, to do. I don't think that, that adding an, an additional ins international institution w would help, uh, help, help that much. I think in terms of survey for private investors, this is not the job of the IMF. Certainly, other institutions can do it. Uh, and, 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 but we will certainly welcome it. We will, we, we're using it. Uh, you, we're using, for example, the BIPs, the Enterprise Survey of the World Bank on, on how much in investors pay uh, as, as a share of the, the business. So these are uh, useful information for our own analysis, but it's not up to us as an institution to, to do that. Thank you. Okay. So I think I'm not going to try and sum up everything, but I think, um, I think you must come away from this session thinking that the economic costs of corruption are incredibly high, particularly in the Middle East and North Africa, where perceptions of corruption are still, uh, are still very, very negative. I suspect that the political costs of corruption may be even higher than the economic costs in terms of the erosion of trust, the, the, the fueling of populism and, 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 and anti, anti, uh, kind of anti-elite sentiment, uh, and also the, the, the hugely negative consequences for investment and growth over the long term. And so, you know, those are all those are all hugely important reasons why this needs to be tackled. But I also hope that you came away from this session with a slight sense of hope, uh, because I think all of our panelists have given us uh, very good examples of where countries have tackled it uh, and where the, the issues are much clearer. And I think this, 
this focus on, on, on eliminating complexity, both in fiscal policy, regulatory policy, tax policy, the business environment, eliminating all of those opportunities for corruption uh, is a very strong theme, as well as strong leadership. Uh, and particularly, I think, as you said, Zane, from the top, so that, uh, so that the unacceptability of, of, of corruption is, uh, is made very clear. But of course, vested interests and the politics of this is hard and very difficult. Uh, and those of you who have fought corruption in various countries are very brave people. Uh, some of you may have seen Ngozi Okonjo Owela's new book, which says, I think the title is Corruption Can Kill or Corruption is Dangerous Business. And I think that is true. Um, but I think we need a lot of brave people in the region over the years ahead because if we can solve this problem, I think it opens up and unlocks all sorts of both political and economic opportunities that could have huge payoffs for the Middle East and North Africa. So with that, let me close and thank the panelists for a wonderful conversation and thank you for attending. <laughs>